Good morning, everyone. My name is Dave Howard. I'm part of the teaching team here at Montclair Community Church. And uh, if you're just joining us for the first time, welcome. We have been studying in the book of Mark uh, for a little bit. We're only in chapter 3. So I think if you go on the website, you can catch up to previous lessons. Um, by way of introduction, though, I, I am going to review some of the stuff that we went over last week, because really this lesson uh, and last week's lesson is really kind of like one. It's like a 1A and B. So um, I know you guys are in recovery from a daylight saving swing, so I'm going to go easy on you. I will let you know now I have half the notes I had yes, uh, last week, so that should be a mercy to us all. Amen, right? Okay, so <clears throat> uh, by way of introduction, you, you remember last week uh, there was this impromptu, seemingly impromptu meeting in a wheat field with Jesus and the Pharisees ah, and his disciples. And if you recall, the Pharisees thought that they should note out some Sabbath violations that were being performed by Jesus' disciples. They thought that they should uh, kind of call Jesus on that. Hey, did you notice this? And what that did is that led us into the process. We started to look at the Pharisaic process. How did these guys to come to have all these rules and make all these rules. And we looked at just basically the how-to on rules in, in Phariseeism, how to, how to uh, look at the word and how they interpreted the word and how they had commentary on the word. And I have something in here, and I don't know I was fair to these guys last time. I, I want to do a, a Pharisee plug, if I would. I kind of felt like I was unfair to them, and I don't know if I really portrayed them as they ought to. And I think, in general, Pharisees are portrayed as the bad guy, right? The Pharisees, when you see the Pharisees in the image of these little scenes, those guys are wearing all black, right? They're wearing all black. There's, like, dark makeup under their eyes. Somebody's got a Darth Vader helmet somewhere in there. Those guys seem as if they are the bad guy in the character. And I think it's important to note something. The, these were devout men. You know, you know what I mean? They, they chose to look at the scripture and study it. That, that wasn't like high fashion back then. So I, I, I think it's fair to say, to, to, to kind of give them a little bit of props, that they have looked at the scripture. They became devout and zealous about the scripture and about being interpretive about it, about how do, we, how do we really read this thing? How do we really understand this thing? And even though they created all these rules, what, what they were really trying to do was basically saying, well, this is the law. And this thing, this is like uranium. This thing needs to be acknowledged. This thing is is hot lava, and we have to respect it. So what we will do is we will create a margin, we'll put a fence, we'll put a wall, so that no one ever goes near violating the law of God, that we would just respect the law. They, they created this fence. Now, even with that, and I'm giving them props, they are still, they, they, you guys know what a movie trope is? A movie trope is these classic campy scenes you see in movies. Like, you know, like the, the, the scene explodes, and then you see the good guy walking away with this big explosion. And then, you know, when he walks away, what does he do? He goes into slow motion mode, right? And he walks away. That's a movie trope. You see that scene played out in many movies. And for me, I see the Pharisees as this, the, the trope, you know the one, where the two guys are battling and battling, and then the final scene, the bad guy's hanging for some reason off the scaffold, off the edge of the building. What does the good guy do? The good guy reaches his hand, right, in the final act of mercy, even though he just was tr 
the, the bad guy just tried to kill him the scene before. That final act of mercy, he reaches out his hand. What does the bad guy do? He either tries to pull him down or he ignores it altogether. I'm going to stay bad throughout this scene. And there's a part of that going on in the Pharisees too. You know, it's, it's like they are devout men and there's a little misinformation going on. They're, they're misinformed in what their devotion has done. So uh, I use that as our, our kind of like snapshot when we're looking at them. Now, remember, uh, they studied the Torah, right? They studied the, 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 the books, of the Mosaic books, and they came up with this interpretive process. And in that interpretive process, they ended up with how many? 613 laws. And I remember I, they, they got broken down into orders and to how you should dress and how you should construct and what you should do and what you should eat and what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do. And in contrast, we looked at the Sabbath as created by God. And if you remember, that came from where? The first book of the Bible, Genesis. And, and what was the prescription for the Sabbath by God? Work your six days, right? Hustle, go do your stuff. Work six and take a rest on the seventh. And make sure you do that. That was the prescription. That was the Sabbath prescription. But it is a Sabbath unto God, remember? So as a Sabbath unto God, I should be reflective of God. I should be thinking about God. I'm not thinking about the football game coming up. I'm not thinking about going to the moon. I'm not thinking, I'm not trying to enrich myself on the Sabbath. I'm trying to kind of look at what God has done. Psalm 8, if you look at Psalm 8, and I didn't do the whole, write the whole Psalm down, but Psalm 8 is basically David saying, man, look at the stars you've made. Look at this. And that's, that's when you know that the famous uh, question he asks is, what is man that you are mindful of? You've, do, you've done this and you've done that. And that's like a Sabbath reflection. Look at all that you've done. Man, that's awesome. That's awesome. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, I just want to pause there. That's, that's what the Sabbath is, was God creating this time that we would be mindful of him. The idea was not that we would sit in a dark room, right, because the Sabbath was from uh, sun up to sun down, and the whole idea is that I don't sit in a dark room on my hands, so I don't violate any, any rules, and wait for that time to pass. That's not the idea. The idea is that, yes, you live. You live, and while you live, you think about me. While you live, you, you reflect on, on the delivery that I have delivered you from, which is your sin. While you live, you think about salvation. You dedicate that day for just that. So now we had, right, if you recall, we have a contrast now. We had those two Sabbath we hit, right? Sabbath is, I don't know if that's a, I don't know, a plural of Sabbath. But anyway, uh, we had the condition where you had two Sabbath. And you had a Sabbath from the Pharisees, which was shutting them, shutting the people out. Matthew 23, 13 says, but woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. This was the, 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 the Sabbath that they created. And then look what it says. It says, for you neither enter yourselves, nor you allow those who would enter go in. You had that Sabbath, and you had the Sabbath that God had prepared. When we left last week, we were left with the two scriptures, right? At the very end of uh, the chapter 2 of Mark which God was basically saying, Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And that's going to help us as we go into now, right? He left us with that. Sabbath was made for man. Sabbath was made as a thing to minister to you, right? Yes, you stop and you think of me, but I really did that for you. And while you're thinking of me, what's happening? There's, there's some kind of relationship thing going on there, right? I'm thinking of you, and you know what? It's funny, because I thought of you, too. And we start to build that cycle, that relationship, 
that beautiful relationship. And then something else happened too, right? He left us with that thought, and then the other framework was, and Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. We get it, we've read that, and we say, yeah, okay, Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. Remember, when we, when we look at Scripture and we exposit Scripture, we want to think about what those people were thinking. And those people were thinking, how dare you make yourself out to be God? God gave us this prescription, not you. How dare you? Now, you do not see the response of the Pharisees yet, but there's a buildup. It's happening. It's happening. How do I know it's happening? Because in the first chapter of Mark, they were amazed right? You see that word? They were amazed. They were astounded at this new teaching from this new guy, Jesus Christ. Have you heard this teaching? Right? That was the Pharisees. And we're going to see, oh, how things have changed by the end of the reading today. So we get the contrast and we're basically the God, the son is saying, hey, this is my intention for the Sabbath and this will be my intention for the Sabbath going forward. So we're going to look at the reading in Mark, right? Mark chapter 3, those six verses. But remember, it's a synoptic gospel, meaning all three gospels, Matthew and Luke, along with Mark, create a full picture. So I'm going to call on some of the scripture from the, some of those. They give the exact same account, but we get a little extra from each one. So I'm going to just pull on some of them as we go through, and I'll tell you uh, when I'm doing that. So this starts off, we write, you heard the scripture. It says again, uh, actually it's, it's odd because Matthew starts this off with right out of the grain field. So basically they were in the grain field, they had these words, and now they go to the synagogue, which is kind of odd, right? It's like fighting for a parking space outside and then, oh shoot, we ended up at the same church. You know what I mean? It's kind of like an odd exchange going on there. But it, the other Gospels don't. It says as another time. But here we are in the synagogue. And what does it show us? It says, again, he entered the synagogue, speaking of Jesus, and a man was there with a withered hand. What is that, a withered hand? It's not a term we hear now, not a term we use now. The Greek basically describes this hand as shriveled, dried up, wasted. It's actually a term used for gardening. In other words, if I saw a branch that was withered, what do you think I would do with it? I'd lop it off, right? But this is a human being. We're not going to lop off his hand. But that is the condition of his hand. And I kind of think, well, listen, if you do not, if you ever seen anybody with atrophy of a muscle, right, because they haven't used it. If you've ever seen someone who's been in a wheelchair, the legs are usually about this big. There's everything kind of gets very thin. It gets very sinewy, right? You can see the bones, and there was no use of his hands. So this is what we have in the synagogue, and it is noticed by Jesus, and it's noticed by the Pharisees, right? I don't know if this guy was a plant. I, there's a lot I don't know. So I don't know if the guy was wearing an orange T-shirt, right? I don't know if that, that attention was being drawn to him, but I could tell you that Jesus noticed him. And that's, that's what we're getting the idea of. Jesus noticed this guy. Uh, Luke, in the Gospel of Luke, it points out that it is his right hand. 90% of the world is right-handed. Right? And I rely on my right hand to do many things. As a matter of fact, you could equate that I rely on my right hand to do work. And in that day, that's not a welfare state. If a man who relied on his right hand, actually tradition, it's not scriptural, there's some traditional texts that say that he may have been a mason, that this might have been an injury. So you do the math. I can no longer work. What, is that re what does that reduce me to? Perhaps a beggar? But I can no longer uh, um, provide for myself. I can no longer provide for my family. That's all I have with this guy. The other thing I have with this guy is I don't know if he is a regular attender of the synagogue. <laughs> I don't know if he just waltzed in that day. 
I have no idea what his affiliations are. I don't know how much faith he has. He is just called up. We don't get to chime in on that, right, as we do in the modern day church. Does he have enough faith to be healed? Jesus doesn't give us that option in this, which is good, right? Because we kind of mess things up. But I do know who has a lot of faith in this. The Pharisees. Those guys got a lot of faith. Look what it says. It says, it says the Pharisees watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him. The, the Pharisees were basically rooting for Jesus. They were like, oh, come on, man. Do it, do it, do it, do it, do it. Come on. And I think that's a beautiful thing. I think it's a beautiful thing that it could be expected that Jesus wants to heal. I think that's a beautiful thing for us to look at, that I, when I look at Jesus, I have a lot of thoughts, but that I should expect that he wants to fix me, that he wants to heal me, that I'm looking from afar and I'm looking at Jesus saying, yeah, I, I actually want to do that. And, and the Pharisees are like, watch this guy, he can't help himself, <laughs> right? He can't help himself, and yeah, you're right, he can't help himself. He has come to heal. So we have that perspective that we're looking at uh, as we go forward. And now the questions start. Matthew starts with a question. It actually, you have this guy, and basically Jesus calls him, um, and he calls him forward. It says he was seated in one of the gospel, and he calls him, and he says, come here. So there you have the man, and you have Jesus presented before the synagogue. Actually, Luke has that Jesus was reading in the synagogue. But here you have them both, and they are presented before all. Right? And Jesus now, in Matthew, it starts with the Pharisees asking the question. And they say, is it lawful? To heal on the Sabbath, right? They throw out the first volley question. If you look at the other Gospels, Jesus asked the question, but it, the question kind of falls in the same realm. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Well, when we looked at all those 613 laws that the Pharisees had added, uh, nobody healed back in those days. So healing was not under any of those laws. So what were they trying to get at? If, if nobody healed back then, and there was no laws that specifically spoke to healing, what were they getting at? Well, it turned out to be a little bit illegal to help somebody. So if you help somebody during that time, it was illegal. The only way you were able to violate the Sabbath was this term called pikwash nefesh which means that if life is in danger, I get to save a life. Basically, it's from, it, it's from Leviticus, and it basically says, the word is life, the word is not death. So if, there's life, if life is involved, and the loss of life is involved, by all means, violate the Sabbath. Were they thinking about that? I, I don't think so, because you know, the, the Pharisees never credited anything to Jesus. So they knew all these things, but they never said, hey, let's bring that one up. And they probably said, no, don't bring that one up. What else did they have? Well, Jesus tends to ask a question, and you see this in Mark. And he asks them, does your Sabbath allow you to do good or evil? Well, that's a loaded question, right? It says, does your Sabbath allow you to bring death or life? How do I answer that? Because if I say the Sabbath allows for death, well, that would be horrible. I don't even want to sign off on that one. But if I say the Sabbath allows for life, then man, Jesus, I think you're right. And they weren't going to credit anything to Jesus. Jesus asked another thing. It's in Matthew. And he basically says this, and this is a practical question. He says, which one of you who has a sheep, if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out? And then he asks the real basic ground ball question. Of how much more value is a man than a sheep? 
Come on, guys. Are you kidding me? That's just baby. Are you kidding me? The question, though, remains unanswered. And then we jump to verse 5, and I'm going to come back to the other scripture. And the next thing you know, Jesus says, stretch out your hand, and he heals the man. I have to pause here. Because by my title, I looked at this condition of being parched and being withered, being shriveled, being dried up and being wasted. And we see that condition, I see it in two places. I see it with the guy with the shriveled hand, but I also see it with the hearts of the Pharisees. And I, I want to just expand this for a little bit. When we think about the Pharisee, when we think about legalism, when we think about self-righteousness, we will never put our names in the blank. We will never do it. As a matter of fact, when we talked about last week about this whole idea of Phariseeism, we as a church don't suffer under that yoke. We don't know what it's like for someone to be watching us, writing down the rules, saying, hey, you guys violated X, Y, and Z. We have no idea what that's like in this church or in churches in America. We, we have no idea. But the other side of that coin is who is being the Pharisee? And we will never apply that to ourselves. Actually, in modern-day churches, what are, what are our feelings? Hey, man, live and let live, bro. I'm into the Jesus thing, and you're not. All right? You live your life, I live my life. We never declare anything in the modern-day church. You do you, I do me. And we're good with that. Right? So we won't take hold of this thing called Phariseeism, of this thing called self-righteousness. We, we will never write our name on that slip. But I think there's something there when we start to look at Phariseeism. Now, whenever you, you hear this talk of Phariseeism, it's always attached to a critical spirit. Right? You, you hear, oh, a Pharisee. You're, you're being a, very, a Pharisee about this. You're being very critical, right? You're being a Pharisee. A critical spirit is very damaging. Listen, a critical spirit between a husband and wife destroys a relationship. A critical spirit between children and their parents destroys a relationship both ways. A critical spirit. I can't find anything good that you do. That's a critical spirit. I can't see it. And you messed up again. That's a critical spirit. Right? And normally that's attached to Phariseeism, a critical spirit. I don't think we should attach that to Phariseeism. Because if any one of you were talking downstairs in Fellowship Hall and you said, you know what, I don't like the worship music today. I wish they, they would pick different songs. You know what, next week, let's see what they do. And if they don't sing the right songs, I'm going to kill them. <laughs> Verse 6. Right? What did it say in verse 6? They looked to destroy Jesus. This is not criticism. This is not a critical spirit. There is something at work here that is far more insidious. There's something more here. This is not critical. I'm not looking to kill you because you didn't sing the right song. There's something more here, and I want to look at this. I, I looked at three things, and I... There's probably many, but I, I just tried to isolate this to three things that show a withering heart, that reflect a heart that is starting to wither. And I mean that in a spiritual sense, a heart that isn't beating the way it used to. It's starting to dry up. It's not even feeding the body anymore. And the first thing I looked at was recognition. When we fail to recognize who God is, the Pharisees reduce God to a refined list of do's and don'ts. And if you ask them, I bet you that they fell on the right side of their list all the time. They did all the do's and they didn't do any of the don'ts. And if they did violate one or two, they weren't going to let you know about it. And in a strange way, we do the same thing, right? We kind of look at what we do, 
and we say we're covered. I do my little thing. I come here. You know, but I do my thing out there, but I'm all right. I feel confident in what I do. I feel that I know enough of God to not know any more of God. I fail to recognize who God is, and even greater, I fail to recognize I always need him. I always do. From the start, from Christianity at the beginning of my life, I need him the same way years later. Years later, the Pharisees fail to recognize, and I think we fail to recognize too, and that leads to deception. First John, we did a series way back on First John, and First John kind of talked about over and over, don't be self-deceived. Don't be self-deceived, and we see there's two types of self-deception I want to point to, and I, I, one is really devastating. The Pharisees were very confident as being the leading religious sect. They were very confident in their understanding of the word, and they're playing it out. I know how to play this thing out. I know what it should look like. I know what you guys should see when you see me, the Pharisee. I know exactly how this thing should play out, and they were very confident with that. That's self-deception, because they thought that that was good enough for God, that that equated God, that a holy and righteous God, that I will do enough do's and cancel enough don'ts out to make me acceptable to God, and they felt acceptable. And they felt that way confidently. So they were deceived in a way that they couldn't even realize it. Ours is even more problematic. How are we deceived? We're now in a time where people feel like, yeah, I don't really do the right thing by God, but you know what? I don't really care. I don't care. Yeah, I, yeah of course I go to church. You know, because I, I kind of feel in the back of my mind that God will understand. So I could kind of defame him a little bit. I could kind of talk about him in a way that shows I really don't know him, but he's gonna be all right with that. God understands. I give God the understanding on my not acknowledging him. I say, you understand. It's very weird, it's, it's very deceptive to say that, you know what, I'm, I'm not really into it, but he understands. That's a deception. It's a deception because it says, I have taken so precious a gift, I threw it on my dresser. I threw the gift of salvation on my dresser, and I'll get it when I need it. Right now, I don't need it. Deception leads to one final point here. It leads to blindness. It affects our vision. It affects my vision so badly that I can't see all the ways that God is involved in my life. And I'm going to tell you, if you took a breath today and you are still breathing, I don't see anyone that looks dead, maybe sleeping, but dead, not dead, right? We fail to see all the ways that God is intervening and interfering in our life. The little things we miss, you better believe we miss the big things too. How do I know that? How do I know that we miss the big things when we start to let our heart get withered? Look at it right here. The Pharisees watched a guy who was paralyzed walk out of the house, and they didn't see it. The Pharisees see a guy here with a withered hand that was with like this and now is restored fully. And they didn't see it. They didn't see it. Amongst all the other healings, a man who was not in his right mind, demon possessed, and now he's, hey, how is everyone today? They didn't see it. Recognize, right, who God is. If we fail to do that, we become deceived. We become deceived. We, we deceive ourselves. 
and it leads to a blindness to where we don't see God anymore. We just fail to see him. Let's go back to the text with that in mind. Jesus poses the questions to them. They remain unanswered. But they were silent. And he looked around at them with anger. This is the only place in the Bible in the New Testament that associates the word anger that Jesus was angry. Now, yes, when he cleared the tables in the temples, he was angry. He was PO'd, yes. But here it is saying in a declarative manner, Jesus looked at them and he was angry. He was angry. And in the same breath, What's the next piece of that line? He was broken. He was grieved at the hardness of their hearts. And don't think for one second that we do not fall in that category. God hates sin. Newsflash. God hates sin. And he looks at you as the sinner and me as the sinner, and he is repulsed. But yet he's grieved. And he's like, I, I made these dudes. This was my creation. There has to be a way to restore this, to restore this order. So in this same circle, I have the wrath of God, and I have judgment. And in the same circle, I have a grieving God, full of mercy, full of pity, looking for a way to say, come back, to say, come back. So you, whenever I look at this, I'm like, hey, man, is there a possibility that the Pharisees could have come back? To, like, maybe in the next scene, they'll jump in on this. Right? What do we see happen here? He was grieved at the hardness of their hearts. And at that point, he looks at the guy and he says, stretch out your hands. He could have told the guy, go home and your hand will be better. Could have did that. But he made sure that we all looked at this guy, including the Pharisees, to say that, you know what, there's some of this power here for you. There's some of this healing work for your withered heart. There's something here for you. You don't see it. It's so hard. It's like cement. You see yourself. You hear your own voice. But I want you to look at this guy. Because this guy came in like, yo, is this the synagogue? He came in like that, and now his hand is restored. And I know who he is. This guy who was picked out of the crowd was not the bystander in Jesus' story in order for us to look at the Pharisees. This guy was not guy. He knew that guy's name. He knew that guy's soul. He was created by God. It's not random, this healing. This happened with intent. The same way salvation happens with intent. You don't fall in on the wave of salvation because my boy got saved and my, my wife got saved and now I'm down with the crew. That's not how it happens. God intends to save. And he saves you. You. It's a personal thing. And here he is. Stretch out your hands. And it wasn't like, all right, man, listen. Uh, you got to follow this uh, physical therapy schedule. Let me rub it out for you. It's a little stiff. His hand was completely restored. That guy could rake leaves. That guy could dunk a basketball. That guy was ready to work. He was ready for service. He was activated. He was good to go. This Jesus, whom I did not know, just like the rest of us, whom I did not know, whom I did not look for, just like the rest of us, called me out and fixed me. He fixed me. This is really good. He fixed me. I'm down to the close, guys, so bear with me. 
Now, my hope was that the Pharisees would look at this and say, fall on their feet, fall on their knees and say, Jesus, pick me now. It didn't happen in this scene, but maybe later, right? But what happens in this scene? The Pharisees went out immediately and held counsel with the Herodians against him, verse 6, on how they might destroy Jesus. Uh, the, the Herodians were Hellenistic Jews. The Herodians were a political party that was tied to Herod. The Herodians were not down with the Pharisees, nor were the Pharisees down with the Herodians. So my best way to kind of describe this is if the Black Panthers and the KKK got together for a common goal. They were not groups that would normally play together in the sandbox. And now here they are so that we might destroy him, the Christ, so that we might destroy him. So when, when we look at this and as we, we leave uh, this passage, um, I, I was just stricken by this withered heart. Um, it, it kind of left an impact. As, as, as we all look at the church, we all should look at the church. It's Jesus' church. I should care about it, right? It's Christ's church. I should care about it. Actually, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a card-carrying member. Probably many of you are. But I, I, I look at this withered heart because I, I never attach myself to self-righteousness. I, I don't. I am, <laughs> but I don't, right? So I will never call that one but I will always claim that, you know what, I could see areas where I'm not getting blood flow. Where my heart's kind of drying up a little bit. You know what happens when you put all those three things together, right? My, my recognition, my deception, and the last one was my blindness. What, what did we see in this? this? This is the thing that's, this is the crazy part here. It says... I take all those things, all that distance, and it basically says that the Pharisees got together so that I or they may accuse Jesus Christ. So now, man, I get together with the only voice inside my head, which is my own, and man, it sings a great melody. And I'm in a state where I don't see Jesus, and you know what I do? I accuse him. I accuse him because I say that what I say is right. And what you have declared, not so much. And the only voice I hear, right, what does it say? The devil, the world, right? These are the voices clamoring. Jesus, but the only voice I hear sometimes is me. I love to hear me. And me accuses the Christ. You say, well, Dave, man, what, that's all, that's messed up. That's jacked up. What is the remedy? I, you know, there's always an application part of the service, and I just have something very simple for you. It's very simple. It's one line. What does Jesus say? That you take up your cross and you follow him. You take up your cross and follow him. It doesn't mean you're going to get a great job. It doesn't mean that the people in the hospital that I care about are coming out tomorrow. It doesn't mean that things are going to work out with my wife and I. But it does declare surrender to the only source of life and hope and salvation. That's what it means. It waves the flag. And it says, today, I take up my cross. And you know what he asked me to do tomorrow? Take up your cross and follow me. I messed up yesterday. Take up your cross and follow me. Same. It's like a loop. It's like Jesus on a loop. Take up your cross and follow me. 
Some of you have taken up the cross and have followed him. Some of you have laid the cross down. I don't want to follow you anymore. I see some other options. There is no other way to God except through Jesus Christ. There is no other way. I guess that's the good news and the bad news, right? There is no other way except through Jesus Christ. And he doesn't promise you roses, but he promises you total salvation of your soul, that you would be with him at his right hand in heaven. It's not 20-inch rims on the car. It's not any of those things. It's none of the things that any one of us, if we made a list, would say we like. And I think this is pretty good. Throw it away. It's not part of the cross. It's not part of the cross. So I leave you with that. And with that, <laughs> let's pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, uh, blessed be your holy name. We thank you. We thank you uh, that through your word you show us, even with the Pharisees, this uh, self-righteous group, this apostate group that you call out to them. You challenge because you care. You say no because you love. And you still keep calling us back. I thank you for your scriptures. I thank you that you give us a way. Jesus Christ is the only way. Lord, uh, let us not lose sight of that. Let us not declare any other way as the way. Let us not listen to any other voice. But let us look at Jesus Christ, our reigning king. May we call him king in our hearts, Father, and may it show in every aspect of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.